Agile Manifesto talks about individuals and interactions over processes and tools. And uh, I think I think that's that's a great inclusion. Agile is a social experiment. And over the period of time, what I have felt is that uh, these interactions have been addressed quite a lot. Uh, however, the I in the individual is still you know remaining to be addressed properly. So that's where we are kind of today filling in the gap. And I would like to talk about the transformation in the light of an individual today. Yeah, so that is the setting, the context here. So <coughs> I'd like to uh, begin by quote, to know is good, to live is better, and to be, that is perfect. So that's the opening punch. And we really want to be, and as uh, Diana mentioned today in, in her keynote, right? Fluency is something that you do without thinking. So it's kind of getting into the bones, not at the surface level, right? And uh, going further from here, so just to uh, expound upon what, what really can get into the bones, first of all, we have values, principles, and practices. Just kind of gloss over the kind of dictionary meaning. Values are something that is very important to an individual, <laughs> and to be able to, uh, uh, and when an individual acts or behaves, they really come out from the, uh, from the core, core heart or the inner part. So those are the values which kind of come ahead in the express in terms of behavior. Secondly, what are principles? Principles are kind of the glue which helps you translate the values into action. Yeah? And finally, you have the practice, which is the actual application of your values in your day-to-day -day action. Right? So just to uh, talk about examples. Yeah, so if you take a quick example, uh, you know, a lot of us practice unit testing as, as, a, as a practice. We use unit testing as a practice. Now, if we ask ourselves what is the value that we are actually after, it's really feedback. Right? What we're trying to gain there is feedback, different kinds of feedback. That's one of the values that we want from unit testing. Uh, and the principle that we're trying to here meet is basically fail fast. We want to get faster feedback so we can fail. Right? So if you would try to take unit testing as a practice, what is the real value and the principle behind it is something like this. Let's take another example. Why do we write self-documenting code? We write self-documenting code so that we have declarative expression. Why do we care about declarative expression? We care about declarative expression because we want our code to be communicative, right? I mean, that's the reason we use a higher order language, else we would be writing code in zeros and ones, right? It's about declarative expression. Uh, it's about communication, uh, but you get it through uh, declarative expression, right? So there's a couple of quick examples. Let's take uh, something else, right? How many people here have heard the term MVP before? Quite a few people. That's the new fashion these days, if you will, right? MVP stands for minimum viable product, right? And and the if you think about the essence behind the MVP, uh, what is it about? Why do I care about an MVP? Is it so that I can go through the build, measure, learn cycle quickly? That's a means, right? The, the, the value that you really care about is validated learning. And just doing this does not mean you're going to get validated learning. So is MVP really a practice or a ritual? I'll talk about an example I recently came across in a company where they use this term called MVP very, you know, it's like the most fashionable thing today, right? Everyone should be doing MVPs. So you're like, OK, what is MVP? And they say, well, our first release is an MVP. How long is your first release? Six months. So you're building an MVP for six months. Yes. Perfect. I mean, you get the idea that what MVP is, you're going to try and take a small subset of it and do all of that stuff. But isn't that too much of building and very little of learning? So as a ritual, you've got all the words, the vocabulary, the terminology going very well. But when it comes to realizing the real value, it's a question mark. So you can do a little better than that, right? So if you think about if, how to improve from there, let's say we build a mini version of what we envision, and we try and quickly put that out there. Right? This, is, this is kind of trying to validate your most important hypothesis. Right? And now you're talking about you know, something more deeper, something more meaningful 
with regards to MVP. We could go further down and we could say, you know what, I don't even need that fancy application. I can simply have a Google Doc and I can validate my business idea, right? That gives me validated learning and quickly if I can move through that cycle, I am thinking, I am believing, I'm being what the idea behind an MVP is. But we can do better than that. What is better than that? Can I have audio on this? Audio? So about a year ago, we had an idea. All right. So my name is Paul Howe. I'm going to talk about a specific technique that my startup has used to conduct really realistic, really effective user tests of, of our ideas. So about a year ago, we had an idea for a social purchase sharing app where you would stream out what you're buying to your friends and they would share back with you what they were buying and it was going to be great and it was going to be a, like a social networking take on product reviews. And being a lean startup, we mocked it up, static prototypes, we got it in front of a lot of people, and, and they said, you know, I'm not going to use it, but I could see how other people might use it. And then we heard that again and again, and we said, well, well why wouldn't you use it? And they said, because I don't know which of my friends would actually use this. And it made sense. It's a social application, and if they don't see the real faces of their friends that they can emotionally connect with, they can't actually grok what it's going to be about. So I said, all right we need to, to make this a more realistic test than what we've done. And we drilled down on the most important interaction on the site, which is when someone does a purchase and shares it on Facebook and it appears in, in their friend's news feed. And we're interested, would people actually click? Would they care? So we thought about, uh, you know, how can we make this realistic? Do we have to build the whole thing and build this pretty serious sized app to do this? Or can we fake it really well? We decided to try to fake it, and the technique we used was a Grease Monkey script. So if you're not familiar with Grease Monkey, it's just a simple little JavaScript that can change the way a website appears. So, so here's an Amazon product page. After I installed Grease Monkey, it now pops up every time I go there, a little yellow box that shows competitors' prices. So um, it's specific to one page, and, and it alters that page. So, I went on rentacoder.com, described what I wanted, and I found a guy in the Philippines who was willing to build our script for $40. We sent our $40 across the ocean, <laughs> and a few days later, sure enough, back came the script. And it's pretty simple. There's the whole thing right there. You just drag that into Chrome or to Firefox, and it wakes up every time it gets on its target page. So every time we went to Facebook, it would wake up and it would run itself. So the next thing we do, is our standard procedure. We post an ad on Craigslist, say we're running a social media focus group, we bring people in, say, what's your favorite social media site? And invariably they'd say Facebook. We'd say, great, why don't you log into Facebook? That's a great idea. And up would pop their newsfeed, and they're feeling totally in control, seems very realistic. Their newsfeed pops up, and the Grease Monkey script runs, and it inserts fake content into their feed, and it's using their real friends' names and faces. So it's pixel perfect real. If we'd built the whole thing, it wouldn't have looked any different than that. And so then we sat back and said, well, are they going to notice this content that our app would normally insert into their feed? And sure enough, no prompting, they were like, well, wait a minute, my friend Michelle bought a Lady Gaga album, and my friend Charlie bought you know, an iPad, and they noticed, and they reacted very strongly. <laughs> I hated it. <laughs> this, is how, this is how Facebook is going to hell. It used to be about friends, and now it's about commercial stuff. Uh, I remember back in the day, we would share poetry, and now I hate these ads. Uh, and we did it 50 times, and there were three people who liked it. So it was a very different reaction than when we did the initial prototypes. And it really wasn't that hard to do. Uh, you know, it was a $40 script. So that's my main point. It, you know, don't think that you just have to do with paper. You, you, you can do something better. Uh, so one thing to explain about Grease Monkey, it only works on the computer that you're testing on. So it's good for one-on-one. -on -one. So we couldn't really point, change right? for I'm going to pause now. You get the point. So this is, you know, taking the whole MVP idea to almost another level, right? And I would argue that, you know, in spirit, in value, this is actually getting you directly over there without actually really having to build anything or trying to do anything fancy. So MVP doesn't really mean that you have to build something to get MVP, right? 
uh, to, to get validated learning. It's about focusing on validated learning and how quickly can we get there. So that's a, just a quick example of thinking at these levels and how we want to help you know, all of us to start focusing on the values rather than getting caught up in the practices. While the rituals, the practices are important, you really need to dive straight into uh, the values. And so we're going to take a few more examples, and we're going to turn it into a workshop, which means we want participation from your side. And let's try and take a few more you know, agile practices and see you know, if do we really do them as rituals, or is there ways to really get to the core of the value behind them? So let's talk about stand-ups. Do you want to talk about stand-ups? Yeah, well, uh, we always uh, go to the stand-up. How many of you really go to the stand-up and ask these three stereotype questions? What did I do yes do yesterday? What am I going to do today? And what are the problems that I'm facing? And your stand-up is done. How boring is that? Every day you come in at work and ask these three questions. Do you feel ritualistic about this at some point? Well, why am I doing this? So is this is this Actually, it's funny. One of the speakers before at some time I just popped in and they were they were talking about, you know, we've done this, we've scaled it at the entire program level, and this is just working brilliant. We ask these three questions, we go I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> where are we heading? So let's let's make this realistic, right? What I want is I want seven volunteers. I want seven volunteers to come in here, please. Come in quickly, seven volunteers. It's not going to be too hard. Good. Can we have someone from the back, please? Yes, thank you. Go ahead. One more, one more. Last, one more person. We need seven. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> You're going to be the scrum master. <laughs> <laughs> Whoever shows up last is the scrum master. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what, what these guys are working on, they're working on a dinner project, right? You guys are working on a dinner project and you're gonna do your stand-up today, right? What are the three questions you're gonna answer? What you ate last night? What do you plan to eat tonight? And are there any roadblocks, right? So while these guys do this, I want the rest of you to observe the body language and what's going on over here, right? Hand over the mic. Hi. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> All right, my, name, my name is Karthik. So Karthik, uh, I just want to know from the entire team what you all ate yesterday, okay? And what do you plan to eat today? Are there any problems you are having? Just to take care of your health. That's about it. You see, we have got an important <laughs> meeting coming up uh, next week. And uh, I want to ensure that all of you all are fit and fine. Okay, that's the only reason. So be it. Let's be assured. Okay, I'll start. So what I had yesterday, I really had a very boring dinner. I had like <laughs> rice and dal, like very old dal. So today I was really looking forward to have something nice. But I haven't thought about what it is. But I really want to have something really nice on fine dining, perhaps. Bottlenecks uh, or roadblocks. I was just thinking, okay, how long it's going to take today? So will the restaurants be open by the time I get back home? So that would be possibly the bottleneck. Maybe the, uh, you know, I would say that and the traffic. That's funny. Yeah. Cabbage and potato yesterday. <laughs> and um, no meat for me. Roadblock is that Navratras are going on, so no meat. <laughs> <laughs> and the plan is to have dinner here today. So I'm not a native of this place, so I had yesterday rava idli and rava dosa. And today, the, the roadblock which I see is that I whether I'll be able to find the same way for the same restaurant or not. So <laughs> that feels the roadblock for today currently. I had a rice bowl with some tangy sauce, which was really terrible. And I don't <laughs> know if I again uh, end up with the same thing tonight. So I don't know, it's a roadblock, but it's a terrible. Yesterday, I had a chapati with uh, cauliflower. Uh, tonight, I don't know what my wife is preparing, actually. It <laughs> could be same. Uh, the roadblock is I, uh, I had to go back to home. I don't know the traffic. It will be the Bangalore traffic. It is the real roadblock to reach home actually on time. OK, so what I had uh, yesterday is uh, the idli. I think the idli battle is already left. It is very light for uh, you know dinner to have very light food. And that's why. And also the idli battle is left. 
that's why today also the plan is to prepare <laughs> idli itself if not dosa <laughs> uh, let us see whether it will be boring for my family but that is my plan uh, the issues are every day my family uh, you know uh, complains me that every day you prepare the same food <laughs> <laughs> the issue with me is I don't get time to prepare different different variety of the food since I am a working woman <laughs> Thank you, team, for your time. I have noted down all your note box, blocks, and uh, we'll meet uh, to, uh, today, 3 p.m. individually. I'll call each one of you, and we'll uh, resolve the issue. But you won't waste this time right now. Thank you so much for your time. Scrum Master doesn't give updates. <laughs> 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 all right, I, I want you to just hang in here. Thanks, uh, thanks for the wonderful uh, stand-up. What did you guys observe? What did you guys observe? Anything you want to share about the stand-up? Was there real value in the stand-up? It, like it looked to me like a status update. I didn't see any value out of this uh, stand-up. Okay. The reason being is that everybody discussed impediments, but nobody asked how we can solve those impediments. All right. And the uh, scrum master was behaving like a team leader or something like that. He was interested in his team's updates. Neither he gave his uh, updates. Okay, so that's good points. Any other observations? Yeah, we'll go there and then we can ask there. Team members were not team members. They were not taken to Itai Chaza. They were taken to Scrum Master as a manager and they were divided by a huge place uh, of empty space, really. Uh, hi. Uh, so I think they were not pretty sure what they are going to do next. They were like, okay, uh, they they were they know that they what they have done, but uh, what are their plans? Uh, that was uh, pretty dicey, and nobody was very confident. Okay, good observation. We'll go there. Thank <laughs> I, I noticed that they were, while they were all working on the same thing, there was, th it was all, uh, they weren't exactly, they weren't a team, right? They weren't all trying to achieve the same goal, they were all performing the same tasks. Um, so there wasn't like an actual like thing they were all driving for together. Like, hey, how are we going to make dinner together today? Oh, well, I'm going to get this, and then you're going to get that, and then, anyway, that was just what I noticed. way of doing a stand-up a lot of teams this is a good starting point right let's not let's not uh, take it in the wrong line it's a good starting point but you need to do better than that I mean people have highlighted some things that they observe and we can improve on that right so let's give it another tie right another try we'll do take two this time we want to be genuinely interested in what people are doing and if we can help each other right uh, if we can really work like a team and be genuinely interested in each other's, you know, uh, lending and help or whatever. So do you guys want to do another quick stand-up, right? So, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so guys, as I mentioned, uh, we have a very important meeting coming up. So we all are going to be a part of a big process. <laughs> So we uh, we have a very important project also, you know, that's uh, one of the <laughs> core reasons. So just let's be warm a circle. <laughs> okay, so what I want you all to do, we need to plan out that we don't have anything like, you know, uh, which is out of the way and can cause uh, disruptions during uh, upcoming important project. So let's uh, see how we have planned our food items since yesterday and, you know, we can just think about it and if anyone of us has any issues, we can just, you know, take care Why of it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not doing it, I can do it, it's just a take two, okay. No, we need to express them, it's not because it's taken. Yeah. We're talking like a... <laughs> okay. Uh, it's a scenario is that we have a very important project coming up and we need to plan out. So I have got some solutions, maybe you all have some solutions, we can all discuss as a team how we can take it forward. But yesterday was the same thing, right? Yeah, but uh, that, that time we do not have those issues um, uh, so much, but uh, I've got recently a big... Uh, Mail coming in for management, the uh, value of the project and all, you know. Let's give it a try. 
give it a shot. Let's let's yeah. go around. Give it a shot, right? This time, what you need to focus on is let's keep the three question format that we had, but try and be genuinely interested in what other people are saying and if you can actually help, right? Let's give it another shot. Same, same answer. Or same, answer? Same, same question. Same <laughs> answer, <laughs> but can it be different? We're saying we'll okay. keep the same questions, but <coughs> can we see any difference? So I had Rava Idli and Rava Dosa yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and I'm not a na native of this place, though I love South Indian food. So my friend took me yesterday. Unfortunately, he's coming late today. So if you can give me solutions how to move ahead, I mean, that would be great. Otherwise, I think that is what I'm seeing as an impediment for today. Google Maps. Google Maps. Oh, sorry, you can just but, but I don't know the name of the restaurant I have forgotten there. Yeah, and awesome, awesome restaurant. Awesome. 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 I'm planning to cook Maggie. You want to join me? You'd like to join me? I mean, I'm staying in 621. You can join. I'm at home, so I am going to prepare a idli only. Not rava idli, but it is going to be the rice idli. If you want to join, I'm, <laughs> you know, inviting you. <laughs> yeah, I'd say again, I'm telling the same thing. I think I today I'll stack up with the traffic in the evening. You know, uh, so any suggestion for you know to reach home in a better. Uh, so we can have uh, dinner at restaurant. Go home. You mean to say? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, fine. I, th I think that's a good idea. I think we, we can you try it out actually. Okay. Okay. I'll join you too, <laughs> <laughs> guys. Uh, I'm planning to order uh, some light sandwiches today evening. I would really love that each one of you would join us. We can have a nice time out around there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, observations. I think, the, the I, I think this time this was um, more like, uh, you know, you have a problem statement. You're, you're kind of trying to get to a solution out there. Um, and I, I could see a lot of people participating into it, right? Into a theme which is already set in, right? As a, as a relative context to the, the first session, it was about, it's like a Q&A kind of a thing, right? And, uh, uh, everyone was trying to prepare what to answer, right? For those three questions. Probably that, that was in the top of their mind. Okay. Uh, th uh, that's, the, that's the difference I could notice this time. That's a good observation. Anybody else? So how long did it take? Do you think we could optimize this? Could it be better in terms of the time taken? I also noticed a few people skipped their turns. Right? That's interesting. Is that, is that not violating the rules laid by the scrum gods? Maybe they had nothing to offer. They had nothing to offer to the gods. <laughs> <laughs> so they just skipped their turns. But this is supposed to be bad, right? Skipping turns. Everyone's supposed to give their part of update. Yeah, yeah. But then it's it was skipping a bunch of people. Even if they were not skipping, it intrinsically felt that they gave you something. Yeah. Yeah. They are a part of it. And it's more towards intrinsic uh, feeling like that and showing the skipping of people. Fantastic <laughs> point, right? That's yes. that's what we're kind of driving to. It's not that you have to, you know, answer the three questions and every single person has to answer the three questions. As long as as a team you are understanding how to help each other and making progress. You have some kind of a game plan for today. Uh, I think it's good enough, right? Actually, it's not only the stand-up you can collect the stand-up. You can work together the entire day. You, you can work the entire day. It's yeah. not just the stand-up. Let's do one last takeaway, uh, last take at this, where basically let's drop the three questions, right? We're not going to answer the three questions. Let's focus on what is the game plan for today. What is your goal and how you're going to try and achieve, right? You're going to slightly change it. So let's say I'm giving you the goal saying, let's say we have a guest for dinner today. And we as a team have to work on that. That's, that's our short term goal right now, right? So as a team, what are you going to do, right? Yeah, so you're going to discuss that as a part of your stand up and see how we're going to achieve that goal that we have for today. And we're going to drop the three questions, OK? So we're going to also drop the Scrum Master and go straight to the team. <laughs> <laughs> you can be part of the team, hopefully. 
<laughs> so, alright, guys. So we have a guest today. So, how do we go about it? So, what's the game plan? What do you think we have to do? Once well, we have to plan for menu, what uh, what the guest guest is from which yeah which country and culture, so that we can accordingly plan. Yes, that also. We I feel I, I came to know that he loves kebab, so I'll, I'll, I'll order some starters initially. In the meantime, we can cook something, but then that'll save time and s get the conversation started. So that is what I do. But do we have any budget constraints? No um, big budget constraints, but you know, just ensure that you do not order any crabs. The, he, he does not like crabs. Uh, last time he ate crabs and he was having an upset stomach, so just that's about it. Volunteer with the dishes and the salads. I'll take care of digits. So what did you guys observe? Anything different this time? I, I think the, the dinner passed soon into serving dinner. The dinner, eating, from eating dinner to... It went to all, all the way up to serving dinner, as in they were participating to serve the dinner themselves. And uh, somewhere it moved from a restaurant to uh, the self-service or the they hosting the dinner themselves. That's partially because we kind of induced this goal to start right. with. No, uh, so I, I was allude to alluding to that, you know, where you s the statement is, you know, we have a guest for dinner tonight, but it doesn't qualify anything further, which is um, meaning like, you know, in what format and fashion, which, which is, which is uh, gives room for interpretation, right? It's a, it's a, it's a larger, broader, open-ended statement rather, it's not a question. But it, the team did come up with. The yeah, they, they did come up with, uh, you know, so aspect of approach to solve that. Yeah, given the statement, yes. This time it was uh, much better. Uh, the entire team members, they were trying to synchronize uh, their activities to achieve the goal. That was the actually, was yeah. Okay. So that was the real uh, move towards the proper stand-up. I don't know what a proper stand-up <laughs> is though, but we'll figure it out. <laughs> well, the team self-organized this time. Uh, there was an emergent way of planning it. Uh, they, their focus remained on achieving the goal uh, that was to serve the dinner, included the guest. Um, and there was no particular person, like a scrum master, who was this meeting held for. But this is a team's meeting, which they carried out as a team meeting. And uh, somebody was asking questions to each other that how are we, who's going to do that? And everybody kind of volunteered that I'm going to pick up the kebab. And somebody said, I'm going to do this. So that's a great one. Okay. So there are a few key words that I would look at, right? One is observation from the team. Yeah. Observation from India within the team. So initially, we had a goal. We, ha we have got guests for dinner tonight. The team here, rather, th uh, j rather than just planning for dinner, they were actually thinking for how to make the customer ha happy, guest happy, you know, by giving him uh, 
food of his choice and food of his liking. They're thinking about it. That was a value addition, which I was think from the team perspective. Good point, right? When you leave the teams to kind of self-organize, they, they start looking at doing something more than what was just there on the your backlog or whatever you have, right? They, they look at really delivering value. So there's a couple of quick things I want to highlight, right? One is uh, volunteerism and the whole self-organizing volunteerism thing. Now, if we impose the three rules, three questions, do you think that would come? Becomes more of status giving and status taking, right? But is that bad? I mean, is that bad? That's that's really the essence of what we want to talk through through various different things, right? It's not bad, but it doesn't add any value. It's not bad, but it doesn't add value. So if is it fair to say that you need to start somewhere and you need to start with those rules in place, but you need to very quickly learn how to grow out of them, right? That's those are like training wheels. You need to grow out of them. And we kind of saw a quick demonstration of three different stand-ups and then some variations across those three stand-ups, right? Uh, hopefully, we are moving closer towards the value. What would be the next evolution from here? Where could we go from here? Maybe the next uh, step could be we don't have a, a, a scheduled stand-up meeting, something like that. Teams sync up uh, whenever they think they need it. Yeah. I've actually tried it out. Uh, I initially, for some project, I started off having, uh, for the first week, daily stand-ups. And the team was co-located. Then I really did not feel the need to have a stand -up, daily stand-up. It was just across the desk, like, hey, hi, what's going on? That's about it. And uh, all the team were uh, like seated next to each other, and they just said, "Okay, I'm doing this. I think I should be able to do, and I'm having this problem." The other person would reply, "Oh, I, I have got a solution for you. Why don't you try this out?" So it was a team uh, discussion which was happening across the desks. So we really not need to have every uh, like you know a kind of a ritual. Uh, but there was definitely uh, a log that was b uh, being given. Uh, daily by the team that was like uh, rather than saying okay we had estimated say for eight hours a job and uh, rather than asking uh, you have you have already taken eight hours now it should be had done now why you have not done and kind of no status but he would just say hey, hey, guy, hey guy i would uh, need another couple of hours and i should be done with that so we were doing a reverse tracking the, the way in scrum uh, says and we were able to figure out uh, like if anybody is having an issue and that was done all without having a daily stand up that was the best part Hearing a uh, few things, right? When you're talking about tracking, right? Do we really need a stand-up for tracking? Probably the answer what I'm hearing is we don't because if you're co-located or if we can have a good way to synchronize or if we have a tool that can do that, we don't really need this. I mean, we could use the stand-up really for specific you know, problem solving or coming up with a particular uh, game plan for things, right? Which is where I think it moves to in terms of more of just-in-time stand-ups, right? When you, when you kind of hit a roadblock or when you have something, you pull everyone together, but hopefully because you're working very <coughs> tightly with each other, whether co-located or distributed, you keep everyone in sync of what's happening. And you can still achieve the objective, the value out of a stand-up uh, that the stand-up gives you without technically having to do the ritualistic way of doing a stand-up, right? So thank you guys, we're gonna transition into another example, but thanks for participating. <laughs> so let's look at... Uh, yeah, so, so we saw what, what ritualistic, we, we kind of gave a flavor of what a ritualistic stand-up was. So really, you, they were going, acro uh, going across doing things in a prescribed format or an order. Um, whereas practice is the actual application of the belief. So that's the real delineation between the two terms. And uh, you know, really, uh, rituals, we say, are necessary to start with. It's like when a kid is learning to ride a bicycle, you really need those helping wheels. But when the, when, when the kid has already learned how to balance, right, the same very wheels which were used to learn now become an impediment in taking sharp turns and move across with agility. So you need to remove those wheels. 
So rituals at some point were a helper, but the same rituals become a bar and they stop progress. That is what essentially, I mean, I'm not saying rituals are not bad. They are useful in the training that they give, but we need to realize when rituals are a helper and when they are a bar. They'll help you launch uh, yourself from ritual to practice. Secondly, once you're at a practice level, you need to understand the principles that underpin the practices as well. Slowly rise from practice to principle. Further ahead, the journey doesn't stop there. You need to launch yourself from principles to values. Find out what is the real value that's underlying or underpinning the, the principle itself. So, so keep an open eye, be very watchful, and then you know, uh, tune according to your maturity of the team as, as, as you progress. See what's helping, what's not helping, drop it, add, and that's real agility. So just one more thing. Does, does being agile mean that, I mean, does doing TDD or retrospectives or stories or stand-ups, does it all mean that you're agile? Well, no. You have to question, is that all the practices that you follow, are they a ritual? Are they practice? What are they? Let's look at another quick example. Has anyone seen stories like these? Every day. I've seen a lot of people work on stories like this. As a developer, I want to create a database table so that whatever, right? This is good to kind of try and understand, okay, how to articulate something and stuff like that. So again, as Dhaval was pointing out, it's a good launcher. But you know, maybe you want to get into more of writing something on these lines where you're clearly articulating who is the consumer, what is the value that they're going to derive by doing what, right? And this is, again, good training wheels to move further in the journey uh, towards the value, right? Then we talk about things like collaborative story mapping sessions, right? Jeff Patton is here. He's going to talk about story mapping. But that you know, there's, there's a lot of interesting stuff going on in the collaborative planning session. For example, here we have Bob, who's the expert, uh, who's visited a lot of client side. He's coming and explaining different contexts and trying to lay out what happens in a typical you know, client situation. And then people map out a day in a, a life of Ed, who is one of the users, who's one of the personas of this product that we're planning to build. People start building out these activity maps, start laying out things like these. And then basically you build uh, these collaborative story maps which using which these are not really written in as a I want to so that format, these are more of this is the goal that we are trying to achieve. To achieve this goal, here are a set of things that we need to do, and you just lay out things. And you would notice that the team is fully engaged. They're kind of challenging each other. They're kind of questioning, is that really that priority? Should we move it down? Are there any dependencies? Things like that. And then you kind of get into you know, putting it in your team area and start working on it. There is not much rituals around this after it is done. You don't go sit down and start saying, OK, I need to write this in as a I want to, so that format because that's not really going to help you much. right? Once you've understood the context, once you understood where it is going to fit into the bigger scheme of things, and you can visualize it, you've still achieved the same value. right? Does that make sense? This concept that people find themselves in the journey, they're happy to take it again and again, and it's Fair enough. I, can I ask you a counter question? Is it possible that even after writing as a, I want to show that people forget the value and they still go off gold plating something? is I think once you have kind of described this overall picture of what is the problem you're trying to solve and you've collaboratively worked together to address that, 
to a large extent that knowledge is disseminated into people's head it becomes tacit knowledge to some extent and then as people collaborate and there are other practices that we put together they help ensure that we are making progress on this and not going off in a tangent there will be also times when you know you will have to deviate from this because things have changed since what you did this right so now you have a framework in which you could make changes and you could say here is where we are if we change this this is the impact it's going to have so it gives you all of those kind of placeholders or a framework in which people can operate so certainly it is possible that people will still uh, go in some cases and do something slightly off achieving real business value but the chances reduce in my opinion because now you're collaboratively working as a team right and the knowledge is disseminated much more so here we still have a product owner next i'm going to talk about where we got rid of the product owner altogether If that happens, you could have a product owner kind of helping you, right. uh, which is why I was saying like during your reviews and things like that on an ongoing basis, at least you will be working with the product owner and during the reviews, you would be having other stakeholders or real users kind of validating what you're building. And if you're off tangent, you will fail fast. Yeah, definitely. Right. Now, if we move one step, you know, from here, I'm going to take a specific example of one of the projects that we built on, which is basically a uh, cab optimization uh, product. And all companies kind of provide caps to employees, especially here in India, that's a pretty common practice. <coughs> and then what the company wants to do is, you know, improve the utilization of the cap so that, you know, more number of people are traveling in one car, the utilization is higher. The time taken for the employees to reach office, they want to optimize things by, you know, optimizing the routes and things like that. So like these were kind of certain, uh, you know, brief that was given about this product. This is what we wanted to do. So we went through, did this product discovery kind of a session. We kind of came up with different themes saying what all we need to do at different levels to be able to achieve something like this. And then we kind of jumped in and did a lot of low fidelity prototype interaction design with people. This is real testing happening with real users even before you started building any software. Have we written any stories? No. Have we done any planning? No. We are just trying to do a product discovery, trying to figure out what is that the users want. And what we originally started with is an idea everyone kind of imagined an application where user goes, logs in, enters details and stuff like that. Through these discovery sessions, through these interactions, kind of changed quite a bit to you know ending up with something like this, which was essentially built in a week's time, which looked like a three month project, ended up being something as simple as you know just use Google Maps, your Google map exposes APIs, people can go click on this, select their route, enter the destination, see the route, and then there are also other products available which will give you an optimized route with multiple points, and that's what your routes will be, right? So that essentially ended up being the project. Did we have stories? No, in one week we were essentially done with the entire product. Did we have product owner? No, right? So you could gradually evolve, even though this looked like a fairly sizable, complex, problem with a lot of algorithms that you need to build, you were able to picky bank on a lot of other stuff that people were do, at least to quickly, you know, get something working and see if your hypothesis is right or wrong. So, uh, you know, I don't know if this will work for everyone in every context, but I think it works uh, if we can try and see how we can think from a different point of view. You don't have to necessarily always go through the you know, big long process of gathering all the requirements, breaking it down into stories, creating a backlog. Uh, I, I mean, that might be valid in some cases, right? But I think in a lot of cases, what you will find is something, you know, that leads to a lot of uh, extrapolation, leads to a lot of over-engineering, leads to bloat, bloat in a lot of places. And this kind of brings you back into the more of the lean mindset where you're trying to say, what is the bare minimum I can do, what I can picky bank already that is available and build something quickly. Maybe I'll throw this out because it's only one week of effort that I've put in. Think of this as al almo almost as a spike, right? But at least it gets you started. And now you're not thinking so much in terms of the process, the rituals or any of those things. You're really focusing on delivering value straight right out. Right? That's the kind of transition I'm trying to talk about. Like, you know, 
it was good. We moved from the traditional, you know, big upfront requirements gathering model to you know doing stories and things like that. But I think that's that's pretty outdated. We need to move on. We've learned better techniques since then of how to build products. These days, a lot of large, complicated products can be built very quickly uh, without having to go through the entire process. So that's a very good point, right? So what Sunil is pointing out is that you know this solution seems to work fine when when people on the team understand the context and understand the domain knowledge, and they're able to make some of those decisions, make, make those balancing act, and move forward. What happens when that expertise does not exist within the team, right? What if, let's say, you're building some kind of a really complicated uh, business opt optimization solution where you need to really be a business expert or a domain expert to understand how to do that. So my question to you is if they don't understand, how are they going to get to the stage where they will understand? So interestingly, I've, I've applied this for building nuclear monitoring systems where people don't quite understand what happens in a nuclear uh, system. And uh, you know, the, the challenge, the, the very challenge is the, 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 the person who was running this entire program said, people don't quite understand. It's too risky. I want to make sure that we document everything before we get started on you know, people. And they had spent by now three years doing that. And things had moved because things keep moving in that space quite often, right? So having tried that multiple times, they basically came you know, to us saying, we're going to look at a different solution. Like, is there a different way to do this? So we got everyone in room. We spent a week. And basically what turned out is that people had quite a bit of ideas around, at least because they've been working in that code base or similar code bases. They had some ideas. Now what we're trying to do is bridge that gap so that the business experts can talk about the problems that they have, the people can talk about some ways to solve that problem, and then collaboratively they come up with a shared understanding of what they're trying to solve. There'll be a lot of places where question marks are put and we say we don't know, we're gonna go get some more clarity in this area, but let's map it out in terms of where do we stand today, where we have clarity, what is the most important thing, can we start building that? So I think, again, uh, I, in my opinion, th there's better ways, and we need to work collectively to figure those out. I don't understand the term scope creep, sorry. <laughs> That's what the problem we're trying to reduce by doing this collaboratively together, right? By, so we, if you saw, we were doing paper prototypes. These are real developers who were working on that product, actually going and interacting with users, taking prototypes, trying to get feedback, and then coming back and saying, no, 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 that just blew in our face. This is not going to work. Let's go back. Let's change this. Let's test it out. Let's not spend effort trying to build the product. Let's not, let's not go there without understanding what we are trying to do. Right. Let's let's do that before we start off, you know, splitting work and start going in different directions. So I think that's the problem we are trying to address. And I and, and, and honestly, in my experience, what I've seen is you you have a product owner, they write stories, they believe that everything is under control, but inevitably there's a lot of disparity between how the product owner perceives something needs to be done, what the team wants, what the team is trying to do. So there's a lot of disconnects over there, and that is only realized at the end of the sprint or things like that. It's too late, in my opinion, right? 
and you've already made certain directions, certain decisions, architectural things, that could be a <coughs> lot of cost to come back and correct later. So I think this is what we're trying to address by getting everyone to work collaboratively together to actually have end-to-end -end working prototype on paper before you start going off and building it. Yes. We don't have user stories. Okay, so at least some acceptance criteria we might have to find out. You so if, if we define these themes, uh, if you see here, we've defined these themes, and we're saying in this particular theme, we want to capture employees' travel preferences, right? This cuts across multiple things that needs to be done from different places. We need to get information and stuff like that. And that essentially, when, when that is done, that's how we will know we've been able to do. So at this point, you will say, how do we know this is actually done? So we will build some prototypes, right? We will go get that validated, and we will say, OK, with this information, do we think we would mo move to the next level? So there you have captured, in some sense, your acceptance criteria, right? But we are not really going too much in terms of defining acceptance criteria for every story or defining definition of done for every story. I think that's too much ritualistic way of looking at things, right? Uh, we can do better than that, in my opinion. Yes, please. Absolutely. I was just waiting for you to bring that up. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> like, uh, uh, I don't know how many of you, uh, if anyone attended, uh, uh, yesterday there was a workshop on microservices. Fred George ran that workshop. So the very first thing he talked about over there is that he's been building a bunch of products now, and they don't write tests. It, it's shocking to hear that from someone like Fred saying, you know, we don't write tests anymore. But what do we do? The first thing we build is a monitoring service. Uh, and that's what is our test, right? That gives you live data, live feedback from real system, and that's your test, right? So here, we started with the monitoring as well to, to say that's the first thing we need to do. How do we know if the right cabs have been you know, prepared? So basically, it produces something, and someone sits and manually validates that. That was our first step. M maybe that's a manual test, but th that's how we started. So. Uh, you know, building monitoring in is absolutely essential for I mean, if you want to travel very fast. I was part of that workshop yesterday, and I was really literally blown off because we didn't do any. The, 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 the approach to take care was like get the monitoring services up, get everything up. You don't need any retrospectives. You don't need tests. You don't need <laughs> stand-ups. You don't need anything. You straight away put the code into production. Watch it fail. That's your feedback. That's live right then and there. Fix it. Redeploy. Get done. Sometimes don't even touch the old service. Just create a new service. Copy paste the entire thing and just deploy it. Now I don't think you know that's suitable for every case, every situation. But you know people have been applying some of these thought processes, which we thought were taboo. We couldn't even talk about things like this. People are actually being doing this and running successful businesses. So something for us to think about, you know, is that even a possibility? Is that even possible, right? I mean, have we gone too much into the agile mindset? and become really very rigid about how we think, right? We need to really question, where do we stand? Uh, retrospectives, I'm going to skip that, actually, uh, because I think there's a little bit more interesting stuff coming up uh, after this. So I mean, the, the, what we had on retrospective is typically we start with what worked, what did not work. Then we move to some kind of a little bit more interesting format. We try and look at what we should start doing, stop doing. Then we start looking at root cause analysis. We start going deeper and trying to mistake proof things. This is kind of gradually how we evolve as we practice some of these things. And uh, you know, a lot of teams that we've worked with, we eventually go to what we call as micro retrospectives, or we do only just in time retrospectives and kind of move away from these you know, retrospective retrospectives per se. Uh, and that seems to be fairly good because over a period of time, the team has matured, the team has learned certain things, and now they don't need those training wheels, and you can move away from that. Right? So that's kind of where we're going with this entire thing. Uh, so I, I agree with just in time, micro uh, no, sorry, not micro <laughs>
That's a good point. I mean, what we've had, what we've tried in a few teams is basically have a, have a big poster on the wall where people can stick things that they want to discuss at some point, but they think it's not very urgent right now. It's not very important right now. But it's something like we, we call it a risk backlog, essentially, and we just keep posting things on it. And at some point, we might realize that that item is appearing a couple of times. So let's just pull in and then have a retrospective on that. Right, but that's again a full based just in time retrospective where people have a placeholder to put stuff. And it might not be a burning urgent need that we need to do something right away, but at some point when we all have a breather, we, we might be able to look at that. So that's kind of what we've tried doing, and it seems to be working pretty well. So I'm going to hand it over again to Dhaval. So, so far, uh, we've seen about four practices, right? Uh, Starting with uh, MVP, uh, what do you call retrospectives, uh, stand-ups, and so on and so forth. I would like to ask you to step back a bit now and kind of, you know, look what, what's what's really uh, the essence behind all of this. The essence behind all of this is to inspect, adapt, and evolve. Number one thing is to do continuous experimentation. Doesn't matter if you fail. Organizations should allow individuals and teams to fail. Otherwise, we are not going to learn. So experimentation, and that too should be continuous. From experimentation, we can determine what works and what does not work. Like what we saw, as we gradually, as, the, as we evolve through, we have to drop the ritualistic way of doing. Jettison, be fearless, curate, discard. That's the, uh, and you question and dispel gospels. And if you don't, what really happens is, Either the callousness creeps into the team, you become very indifferent, or you become too fanatic about something. And it's very hard to get results when you hold on tight to something, or when you are totally indifferent. Yeah? So in essence, you are closed for modification. And this, this particular session, in some sense, has been a personal journey for both of us. So that's why we are here talking about this. Also, uh, what I would like to say is, we need to look at this in a very pragmatic way, wherein we have to acknowledge the fact that this is not a linear, straight path. It is a journey, and we are here uh, to progress. Yeah? Success, we have to redefine success as progressing upon progress, which is continuous improvement. It is not about uh, whether I... Uh, it earned this much money, or it, it, it did not earn that, or that, and so on and so forth. At the end of the day, we all are here so that we can experience. And why, why do we have to take that experience? We, because experience helps us to draw out what is within, from within. And at the same time, experience helps us to seed values, which we could do for, uh, which we, we can uh, uh, cultivate further. So uh, what I would like to do is, for example, uh, Life throws us a lot of challenges at us, right? And uh, it knocks, it badgers, you know, it, it nudges us. But if we, if we don't learn from that, then we won't be able to draw out what was within to the fore. Secondly, what I would like to say is that really values are neither handed out by giver nor accepted or rejected. So what, what really are values then? We've looked at all this, and I would like to now bring the context of individual back here in terms of values. Yeah? They are really the inner dispositions of a human being. So let's take an example here. Imagine if two people are pairing, right? And we are arguing about something here. And uh, he says, you know what? This, this is not correct. Do it in this fashion. This is correct. Because I say, I, and I can't go on arguing. And we argue, argue about mundane things. But in this process of argument, I realize, no, wait, Naresh is talking this because he comes from this perspective. All of a sudden, what happens is I try to understand his perspective and try, I develop respect. And at the same time, if he, I'm arguing, he can say, oh, well, he's arguing because he comes from this perspective. Now, both of us have certain value stack, though the priorities of the values would be different. And that's why we are arguing. Eventually, in the process, what would happen is we'll find that the values will permeate. You know, I'll start uh, accepting 
He starts accepting me. We have a productive discussion. And that's how the teams kind of come together. Yeah? Uh, further, by telling and talking about values, it's not going to work. I have a four-year-old kid. I just can't talk to her about anything. I have to be involved with her. I have to respect her time, be with her. And that's how the values will permeate. I, I, if, I, if I preach and talk about values, it just remains in the upper levels of mind. Right? It, today, if we just said, what's the value, like for example, in uh, stories or, or, or retrospectives, and if we just talked about it, it would have been just remained up here. Uh, you know, and it leads to hypocrisy, duplicity, and pretension, right? We don't want that. So the next better step would be to show and remember. That's where we kind of, I'm just drawing a parallel here. We have demos and screencasts. But the best thing is to involve somebody. By involving somebody, you are respecting them automatically. Yeah? My next question is, are you all aware of your own values? What do you value? When you come to work, in less than a minute, you know, write down what you value the most. I don't want to see what you write down. And you know, why I'm saying less than a minute? Because mind has the habit of coming in between and in manipulating your responses. Example, like in our day-to-day -day work, we, we interact with a lot of people. We see you know, a guy comes to you, hey, you know, I paired with you yesterday, you know, it was so beautiful. Let me, I took it even further when you were not here. Let me show you, I've evolved the stuff that we worked on yesterday. That person is actually coming from deep inside, you know, the values are springing forth in his behavior. What about, what about the other person here? He says, I've, I know I've made a mistake here, but I know, but now I know how I can work, I, how I can work on it. This person has also done some reflection. He's, he's very truthful. He's expressing it, this in terms of his behavior. Actually, all these people have certain deep values which they embody. So one has to kind of discover. So for example, if I pick on you, right? Sorry, sir, your name. Lakshmika, your name, right? And then when I say, OK, uh, uh, Lakshmika, you, you're, you're you're too annoying. What would happen? You will frown back at me or look at me with anger. In the moment of anger, what happens is you say, I am angry. You identify yourselves with the emotion, right? But that's not what you are, really. So my question is, who are you really then? What, what can actually lead? To, your, uh, to authentic self-realization of values in your day-to-day -day work? Is it acting with passion? We all say he's so passionate about work. Expressing feelings, thoughts, and ideas. The very fact that Lakshmi Khan can say, I was consumed by anger after the anger has passed away, that means he can step back and watch his emotions. Still step back in further and say, OK, you know, we have the habit of thinking. Let me think. I'm, I'm the idea. I, because we have the habit of losing ourselves into thought. But at the same time, we can control the same thought and come back to it. And you can choose to participate in the thoughts and disengage from it. Yeah? So there is still something deeper, it's, which is beyond self-expression. What we want to do is we want to find out what is it that really leads to self-realization? Ideals that are in higher, uh, that are in harmony with higher nature. Okay. Now, why I'm, why I'm kind of it appears as if I'm going on to the tangent, but there is really the crux here. We'll just come back to this. What are ideals? Ideals are nothing but set of values. Yeah. For example, there are this set of universal ideals. And on this side, you have something which is expressed in behavior or conduct. So for example, if I look at, say, transparency, how many managers in the room? And how many of you actually pad the estimates? Or how many developers, when they do the stand up, I mean, when they do the uh, estimations, if at all you do that, how many of you pad the estimates? 
Almost all. That means there is lack of transparency there. Right? It's not expressed in behavior or conduct. There is a gap between what your inner thing is and your outer action is. Yeah? What about cleanliness? I'm not just talking about physical cleanliness here. If there are developers in the room, how many of you write clean code? Writing clean code is an expression of beauty and harmony. Why? Why do we write clean code? It just helps us to progress further. In a similar way, if, if I look at other universal ideals like fraternity, equality, liberty, so on and so forth, you have, you have teamwork, for example, right? Where does that come from? Collaboration? We saw, saw that in stand-up. How many of you really exhibit that? You know, you have to question all of this. What I would like to do quickly, because I'm falling short of time here, but would like to take XP as a practice because that's what I started out doing with. And I would like to map back these XP values of communication, simplicity, feedback, courage, and respect on this. And uh, XP practices of pair programming, collective uh, ownership, on-site customer, re system metaphor, refactoring, so on and so forth back to the ideals that I've talked about. Communication is and feedback are tools, uh, basically are the tools of truth. They help you arrive, uh, reach the ideal of truth. Simplicity, it's beauty and harmony. Courage, it's strength and force. If I look at XP practices, refactoring simple design and coding standards are there to have beauty and harmony, help you express beauty and harmony in your code. Pair programming, collective ownership, equality, fraternity, and liberty. Whereas all these, planning game, retrospectives, test-driven development, so these are the real core values, the universal values which are kind of being mapped to. Tying back to work, this is if you are, if, if in your inner self you don't have this, how can you express that in your outer, outer work? If you don't value equality or knowledge sharing or collaboration, fraternity, ideals are missing in you, how will you, how will you really collaborate? So the idea is, let's not call this as agile adoption. Using feedback, we need to permeate agility and manifest the ideals. The question is, how do I really begin? Well, as in everything, we have to start from where we are because that's the most near, most next step that I can take. Right? That which is far is the goal. I have to reach there. But I'll have to take baby steps to reach there. Yeah? At the end, I would like to really leave you with questions uh, to ponder. So if, if we look at these ideals which we are talking about here, and we saw in, in, the, in the principles, values, and practices, these are kind of tying back to the universal ideals and expressing into your uh, work content. So the very first question that I would really uh, like to ask is I'll go from bottom here. Uh, have you matched your disposition to the psychological content of the job? How many of we have done that, really? I don't, I'm yet to see an, a, a JD which has a description, you know, which has this kind of laid out. We always talk about matching skills. Java 1.8, Spring 2.0, okay, come in, walk in, and you start coding for us. Well, ha that gives rise to uh, mediocrity. We've seen that a lot. So coming back, second from uh, bottom, is there a gap between inner, and out, inner values and outer action? And if yes, how will you reduce it? So one of the things uh, that I would like to just point out is probably use these tools, map it back to your day-to-day -day work, and use this as a tool. Maybe on the right, you can have a column, one to five. Uh, and you can do a trending of your own, one being nearest or one being the farthest and five being the nearest. 
how far are you all, we all, from expressing this in our daily conduct and behavior? I think, I think no amount of practice or anything, no amount of tools will help you because the out fiddling with this is actually fiddling with the outer structures. You have to first go deep within to find the root cause. So, so that's that's you can take use that use that as a tool, pretty much, and uh, see uh, how you can apply this on a day-to-day -day basis, because. Unless these values are expressed in your job directly, in your day-to-day -day work, you will not be even able to appreciate XP values, let alone your own. So that's pretty much it. Uh, questions, if any, or comments? It will take some time to just let it sink in. <laughs> I don't have a question, but an extension of uh, what we spoke about regarding the inner values and ideas. I also understand that there is a synergy which exists in team members, which I also, when I coach my team members, I try and see if that exists. Because there are always individual motives, always individual values, like you said, how it permeates. I have seen how sometimes some of these universal qualities or the values emerges from the team as well. Like as a team, they have a quality. As a team, they have something which also shines and says, OK, this is what they stand for. So I think that is also something which uh, makes sense in our work context. OK. Yeah. That's true. That's, that's a good point. I mean, the, you could visualize the team as an individual, and it would have certain behavior, certain ideals, certain values for the team level. and those also evolve as the team kind of matures or as the team kind of new members come in. But you would see that at the team level as well. Right. Any other questions? Any other comments? I just want to reflect upon the earlier part of the decision, right, where you discussed um, um, the practices vis-a-vis -vis the rituals. And my question is more in terms of the interest. around certain things that we do. There are no shortcuts. But thoughts in and around no testing, thoughts in and around not having the right level of stories and ethics to the, to the level of details that are required may probably work in five or six sprints feature. I don't know if at an in enterprise level or at an industrial scale can this be implemented. I have not seen it. I failed at it on entrepreneurship at times, but that's my experience. My my view is, uh, what is it that you're hearing from the industry? Yeah, I think that's a great question, right? Can we take this and can we can we you know scale it? Can we industrialize it? Can we you know standardize it across these things? Can would it work at a scale, right? Uh, would it work at a scale in terms of? At a smaller, uh, you know, we see that okay. At a smaller work unit level, this this is okay. But as we start building really large, you know, complicated products, would it scale? Service or service projects would it scale, right? I mean, I have my answer. I, I know what my answer is, and which is why we are talking about this. But what I do want to do is to turn it back into people in the room and see if anyone has thoughts or experiences around trying some of these things. And then I want to kind of give color my, uh, uh, and maybe Dhaval can jump in as well, and then we can talk about what our experience has been and why we are even talking about this. Anyone else wants to share? Yeah. You're talking about the uh, gap between the inner values and the, your outer actions. Actually, uh, in, in, in the industry, if you look at, uh, it is there in, uh, you know, in, at ev any level. It's right from the, you know, the top of the company to the bottom, uh, to, the, to the developer level. So it's a, uh, it's a cultural change we need to bring in, right? So it's, I think it's easy to say that, and sometimes it has to be there actually. S see, you have to be, uh, uh, things you have to do, be the right things to do at the same time, you should be politically correct, right? So 
uh, how do we uh, narrow down this gap? You know, is there any way? I, I, I don't think it is we can completely, uh, you know, uh, run away with this. I think it's a reality. I think it will continue, I think. Uh, I, I'm just sharing my view. And I don't know how at your organization how it is. I, I, this is what my observation, you know, you know a different organization which I worked. I'm in favor of this, not because I know it will happen, but I think that it's a step towards that direction. Our way of work would change dramatically in coming days with digitization coming and socialization coming so much into picture. The customer, customer even asking for every every statistics before taking a decision, as they mentioned, they had a service to check how things would move ahead. So having said all that, the next imperative would be our jobs will not be very big in nature. They'll not the cycle time has to be very less, and it's more of inspective and adaptive. So I think this is a step in that direction. I have seen, I work for Dell, I've seen Dell decentralizing big time, not because they are very good in their thoughts, but because it is the need of the hour. That is what I'm personally feeling. I was about to actually just add, do we have a choice? We are at a stage where we really don't have a choice. We don't have a choice. We don't have a choice. That's we exactly have to do it. We have to my narrate. counter question yeah. was actually that. I uh, would like to share one uh, just perspective. Uh, as we all agree that Agile is a value system, right? But for most of the bigger organization, it's come as a process from top down. And teams don't have much space, you know, just to think about why we're doing it, right? So they start doing the practices and they just stuck up with that. But I would say that uh, if a team is practicing it for uh, quite a long time, if they try to understand what's the re real value and principle behind it, then probably they will understand and that's where, you know, scaling of the, this value-driven approach will be uh, more scalable. So my observation has been a little bit in uh, in, in uh, parts, I would say. Uh, I think way the organizations have, and I'll just give you from a corporate perspective, way the organizations have said that they really want to get to a flat structure, I think some of these values, you can already see them, okay? I think it's more of, you know, it alludes back to the fact that you have a choice, right? Maybe yes, maybe no, but at least where they have made a conscious and a realistic approach towards saying, I want to have a flat structure. I, I also know a lot of proxy statements around it that they say, I want to have a flat structure, but you still have hierarchy. That doesn't qualify. But I, I my observation so far, but it, it probably not, it's not there everywhere. I, I, that's also my observation. But where they say that there is a, a and alluded to the fact of having a flat organization, I think some of the factors which you spoke about you can see that exuberant there. Yeah, it, it's a, uh, uh, just to share, add more perspective to this. Uh, actually, our earlier SDLC processes and other things, uh, which were waterfallish, really typically reflect the industrial age mindset in 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 in, 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 in an assembly style approach, and uh, that's where you know you pass through that at the end of at end of that that output which you deliver, is it according to the spec? Not if not reject i mean that's the kind of the mindset it uh, it uh, it it's it's not going to work because that 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 mindset did not respect uh, individuality in some sense right, so the testing towards the end is actually uh, yeah. manifestation of that yes that's part one, that's part one. yeah yeah and <laughs> when when you dissolve all these things you really start interacting with people and uh, unless you have a very positive environment in terms of values and it actually self-feeds. I've observed that in my team. And it, it doesn't take long to d give a positive spin on things. I mean, that has been my experience. Uh, yeah. So coming back to your question, right? I want to kind of bring some more perspective into that question. Uh, 1999, 2000 time frame, that's when first I got exposed to test-driven development. And I actually fell off the chair laughing because I thought someone was joking. Uh, it's, it's not practical to even think about that. Today, I think TDD uh, is accepted. I don't know if it's penetrated every company, but people accept it saying, yes, this is a good practice, right? And so we've seen the industrialization, if you will, right, of TDD as a practice. But if you talk to, you know, the people who kind of came up with that thought process, right, you talk to Ken Beck, you got, talk to Ward Cunningham, some of these guys, uh, they've actually moved on in some sense. 
right? While they will still say there is value, they will tell you 20 places where they don't do that themselves, right? So I think they are also evolving, right? So when we talk about industrialization, I think it's always about a decade behind what is happening in some of the leaders out there. So to me, Agile has hit that point today, right? It's hit the point where it's all about industrialization. Uh, is, is, does it have the real essence or value that was originally thought about uh, is a question mark, is, is something that we need to ask ourselves, right? And that's where we are saying that, you know, let's bring some perspective in saying, you know, let's focus on the values and let's not try to industrialize or scale things prematurely because I don't think we've really fully grokked it yet and it's still evolving, right? So it's not like this is exactly how you should do and then let's just replicate it over and over again. You know, there is a, it's, a, it's a complex adaptive system and it keeps evolving. So I don't think we can say this is done, let's standardize it, let's scale it across and we're just gonna follow this. I think we are doing that in a lot of cases in, uh, in Agile. Uh, in fact, last year we had uh, Dave Thomas who was one of the keynote speakers. Uh, he, uh, after writing the Agile Manifesto, he was one of the authors of the Agile Manifesto. After writing that, he said he's never been to an Agile conference because he feels like, you know, the, they wrote the manifesto, they codified it, it was dead, right? And, and he was saying, like, really Agile, uh, you know, he put up a slide and he was, he was talking about some of the big frameworks that we talked today, and he said this is exactly what we were trying to avoid when we wrote the manifesto. Right, and here we are 10 years after exactly landed in what we were trying to avoid. So do we wanna go down that path, right? It's a question for us to ask, right? Uh, is, there, is there an answer that we like? Probably no. Uh, the answer is that the industry will do what seems beneficial to the industry. That might not be in the best benefit of moving the thought process forward, right? So while, like you guys pointed out, there has been some, we don't really have a choice, so let's do it. Some cases it's more of lip service. Some cases people are really genuinely trying. But have they really internalized the values? If they have not, how much confidence would you have in this succeeding? I have very little confidence. I, al al I would almost say that Agile is dead. You know, having that, so I can, I can I, the statement I'm making is because, you know, almost 11 years ago, uh, there was nobody really talking about Agile in India, and we actually started that movement here, right? And we've seen that evolve over the years. And we feel like 11 years ago, we were more mature than what we are today. <laughs> uh, it's kind of going in almost a reverse direction. I mean, it's because of the self-fit attitude, and we have the same framework with different names, and the same, the basic principles lie same, and people are supporting it, right? The problem is the principles are forgotten, the values are forgotten, the frameworks have remained, and people have started modifying the tweaking the frameworks and stuff like that, and it's become a business in itself, right? So when that happens, uh, you know, values take a backseat, and then you start questioning, is this really gonna help us? It's a question for us to ponder upon. I know many companies that we've worked with have said, we're gonna go down this route, right? This framework, this framework. And we are like, you know, do you even understand what problem we are really trying to solve? Right? Or we just want to go and pick the next nicest looking fashion and wear it. Uh, it's almost becoming like that. So I don't know. Like, do we want to industrialize it? I hope not. But it's happening whether I like it or not. So uh, I'm kind of like listening to this and, and kind of chuckling. Uh, I totally agree, right? We've got this, this industrialization of, of the agile principles. Um, and it brings to mind one of my friends who's like, well, I'm not, he, he does agile transitions and agile coaching. And he's like, I'm technically I'm not an agile coach. What I do is I bring hope to these places and help people find out that there's something better out there that we can leave and go to. So like, <laughs> he, I, I'm, protect, I'm not gonna tell you his name to save his reputation, but like he, he, he considers it a badge of honor to think about all the people who have moved on to better places after he like helped coach the, even, even if the coaching fails and the company doesn't have the principles and doesn't have the values, but like just the introducing them, like it sticks where it can stick and, and those, those places it sticks is uh, so incredible. Um, so it's kind of just an anecdote about that, so. Well, I'll, I'll tell you my secret, right? I coach, right? And uh, I, I don't know, but the very fact is well, there are two elements which you really, as a coach, look upon. I mean, we are not trainers, number one, so there's nothing to be taught. 
That's the very first uh, principle. And the second is curiosity. Feed the curiosity and you will get the rest of the things done automatically. I mean, that's what I have observed and, that's, and that ties into that thing which you just mentioned, hope, right? So it's, it's feeding the curiosity and secondly, I mean, uh, I don't know, but nature has placed uh, two great elements in every human being. One is curiosity and second is hero worship. Everybody has a silent hero, you know, and that what drives, keeps on driving. I also think nature has its way in terms of garbage collection. It's really well implemented <laughs> in nature. <laughs> so companies who, I mean, we've seen waves of companies come in and go out. And, you know, if you really dig into it, you know, you will find one of the elements is that they were doing a whole lot of things, but the values were missing, right? They, 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 we can talk about some really successful companies and why they're successful. One big element to that would be holding on to the core values long after even the founder is gone, right? That's what to me is a successful company. It's not what practices they do. It's not about what they're doing today, what products they're making. It's the value system that still exists long after the founders have gone. And those companies seem to last longer. They don't get garbage collected while the others do. So right. something to think about, right? I think we are yeah, exactly, exactly on time. Yeah. So yeah. we're gonna shut it down and then we're gonna go outside and if anyone has any other questions, we're gonna take <laughs> yeah, it over there. Thank you. <laughs>